when I start hearing myself too much, that's pretty bad. <laughs> We're going to have our business meeting uh, next uh, Sunday night. It's going to be a time where we come together. And really, one of the great things about ours is is what God does. We just celebrate a whole lot of what God has been doing. We're also preparing as we're looking at going into the next year, uh, the budget laying out, and all of those things that we're going to be giving out next week so that we can begin to prepare for that. We'll have a special vote at that time. But also, we're going to be receiving, as you come in, on the very back page there, there was a... Uh, 52 weeks. This is the new 52 weeks. This is rebuilding the walls of relationship in our life. It's been the series that we've looked at as we've gone into the study of Nehemiah. And this particular month, it is about the brick of discipline. And what I want you to do is be able to take that and be able to look at the scripture verses. And this is the encouragement that I give, is that every single day, just, just take a moment to go into God's Word. It, it's something that we feed ourselves. If, if you get something to drink, you get something to eat every single day, it's to nourish your body. This is a way to ensure that we're nourishing our heart and our soul because that which God gives us allows us to be able to sustain in the midst of times. And we know that there's a lot of uh, situations that are happening around us with our country and stuff, and we just got to be able to bring that to God. So those are some of the announcements that we want to be able to give back to you. Please just look at your bulletin. Other things that are going to be coming up as far as different Bible studies. We will be starting back on Thursday night, uh, not only at 530 because we normally have our, our family meal before, but right at 6 o'clock. We're going to be starting back with our study of the book of Revelation. We finished uh, the Chosen series, which was during the war June and July. And we're going to be going back into our study of Revelations, and it will start back with a, with a re review so you didn't lose anything that you were there. So it's going to be a, a wonderful time, and I invite you to come be a part of what God's doing here in life of our family. So if you will, let's all stand together right now. For those that are visiting, if you would, uh, just remain seated just for a moment so other people can see you. Go around, shake hands, hug next. And welcome each other in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs>
And let's let God do what he does best. And that's meet us right at that moment and holds us in the grip of his grace. Let's pray together. Father, we come and as we, we consider these words, we consider these prayer requests, those that have been expressed for us to be able to voice from this pulpit to, to ask the church to pray, to ask the church to wrap their arms around. And so, Father, we do that. We, we do that because that's what you do for us every single day. The time that we need you the most is when you are, are upholding us the best. Sometimes we forget that. And so, Father, I pray now that in our weakness, you will be made strong. In our confusion, you will give us the wisdom to walk worthy of the calling that is before us. In our fear, you will become the strengthening faith that allows us to move and to go boldly out into this world. Father, the needs that every one of us have in here, we bring before you sometimes those that we voice, sometimes those that we keep within the confines of our heart. But Lord, we all have a need this morning. That's why we come as a church. Not just to do something sort of in the middle as a transition between singing and, and a sermon. Father, this, this is the power central of what we do in this church, and that's pray. Because if if we do not have any power in our life, it's because we have not spent time with you in life. So, Father, I ask now that you meet each and every one of us at our point of need. Because we all come together needing you. Hold us in the grip of that amazing grace. Breathe your spirit of peace and power upon us this day. Open up our ears that we will hear the truth that you have for us. So that we can live that truth in front of so many that need to know you more than anything else. Bless us now. This I pray in the precious name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen. And amen. Please be seated. Let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. What makes a bridge scary to you? What makes it? Now, many of you have driven cars and stuff over bridges itself. There are a variety of different ones. If you look up world's scariest bridges, you will be able to see those, and you're like, I would, I would not even venture to say. But you know, there's not just ones that you drive over. There are bridges that you walk over. Now, I want you to know in my personality of being able to go, I, I take challenges like that, but I think there are some bridges that I would look at and say, yep, works for me. I'm going back the other way. <laughs> because there's a moment to when, when you're stepping out and the clouds are below you and not above you, there's an issue with my trust factor at that moment. Is this bridge going to sustain me? Is this bridge been tested for the weight that I carry, is this bridge going to do for me what it says it's supposed to? And that's hold me up. The reason I start out with this this morning because this is what we're going to be looking at in Nehemiah chapter 8. You see, in Nehemiah chapter 7, we began to start seeing all of us start working toward worship. What does that mean in life? How do we begin to express God in the worth, not just of the worship itself, but how do we begin to start grabbing other people around us to make it more of that, that difference between energy and synergy? Energy is what you do, but synergy is what you gain when you do it with other people. And see, that was chapter 7. But now we're going into chapter 8. See, chapter 8, when you... When you look at that, is about truly the word of God. Now, now here's something I want you to know about this morning, and this is how we're going to do this. Is because today I'm going to give you what I call the thirty thousand foot view. That's kind of where that earlier picture is of where you're looking and you see the clouds beneath you. We're, we're going to go through sort of a, a thirty thousand foot view of chapter eight this morning, because this is a chapter I want us to take time in. 
See, Nehemiah has allowed all the people to now come together, and because of their work, the walls have been finished. The gates have been replaced. Jerusalem is now saved. They're working now and making sure that everything is established on the inside. They are now at a place to where they can go back to what Nehemiah desired more than anything else, and that was to get back to a heart of worship. And in doing so, that heart of worship, ladies and gentlemen, comes from the Word of God. And that's where we'll begin to start looking at in God's word of what that means of what's happening in their life. You see, they're, they're, they're stopping at the seventh month. They're, they're getting ready for that. What is in the seventh month? It begins with a process of rallying together to prepare for worship. There's a couple things that's happening in the seventh month. It's the high holy days of the feast, the feast of trumpets. The Feast of Sukkoth, which is the tabernacles. Yom Kippur, the high and holy day of atonement is right in there. But the day actually begins, the first day of that seventh month, begins with Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the new year. When we look at the new year as January 1st. This is the beginning of the Jewish new year. This is where everything starts going into place and how we're going to be able to start preparing for the festivals that were about to come. That's why it was so important for what Nehemiah did to get everything ready because the seventh month was coming. Only God could have done it. And because God did it, it allowed them to be able to move forward into a place where they can now celebrate God for what he did. Yom Kippur, which is the high holy day, which is the tenth day after that beginning of the first of those seven days, that is ten days of the festival, leads to the high and holy day of atonement of Judaism. What I want us to see this morning is sort of a bird's eye view of what it looks like for us to be able to have a, 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 an essence of what chapter 8 is going to be about. Because we're going to do uh, the overview today, we're going to do uh, the sections 1, 2, and 3, and then at the end of this month, we have a special celebration that's going to be on a Sunday. It's called a Singspiration. And we have a group that's going to be coming in because it's not just about the written word that we have, but it is about the spoken and celebrated and singing word that all of us will be able to enjoy. And I'm looking forward to that. But if you I want you to take your Bibles. And I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I want you to look at verses 1 through 3. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's word. As it starts out in this, this incredible book. Verse number 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gates. And actually rather appropriate there because we talk about Jesus being the living water and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Verse 2, so Ezra, the high priest of priests, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh. Now, all of this, that was kids also. Kids that had reached an age to where they could begin to understand. So here's what, here's what you see. You see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are now all gathered together. Men and women and older kids. Verse 3. Then he being Ezra read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. What is it? Morning was when the light started breaking through. When, when, when the dawn broke. So he read from dawn for six hours. You think that's a long service. <laughs> so he read from morning to midday before the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Six hours. They were attentive to the book of the law. And what God is going to be teaching us as we start going through this incredible chapter is what does it mean for us to have God's truth in our life and how that breaks down of where we move from where we are to where we need to be in the celebration of that which God gives for us and that is the worship of who he is. But before we go into our, our time of study, let's go before the Savior one more time. Father, I thank you for what you're, you're about to do in our life. Father, not just in the words that we share, but Father, just in the days ahead, Father, there is an anxiousness, there is an anticipation of what you're doing in each and every one of us and what you're doing here at First Call. And 
Father, as we look as an overview of, of, of what your truth really means, the word of truth, and Father, then understanding the worship of that truth, of how we apply it to our lives, because then it goes back to what we do with it in the end, and that's the work of truth. Father, your truth is what's going to hold us in a place that holds us in a grip of grace that never, ever lets us go, even when we're weak. Father, you uphold us with your righteous right hand. So meet each and every one of us right now on our point of need because we need you. And it's in God's precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the first thing I want you to note is found in verses 4 through 6. And, and this is the word of truth. Again, we're going to be doing what I call the 30,000 foot view. But when you consider this, it said in verse number 4, So Ezra, the scribe, stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. That way people could see him elevated. It jumps to verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all of the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood in reverence of God's word. That's why when, when we're about to read, as we start out and we read God's word going into the, this is why we stand. We stand in the honor and in the reverence, not just of the word of God, but in recognition of the God of the word. So they stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And then all the people answered, amen. And amen, that's the first amen corner. If you want to mark that out, that's where it starts right there. While lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. My friends, what, what do you do with the God of this word? The, the Bible in your hand, the scriptures that's on the screen, the truth that we find in praise and word. What do we do with God's truth every single day? Here's a key point, and I wrote it down because I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss it. Because when I was studying this and getting down to it, everything we do is based upon the word of God, not the ideas of man. Not stuff that we kind of put together and make it sound good. Everything is built upon precept upon precept, upon truth upon truth. The key point is that if God's word is not supreme in our lives, then the God of this word is not supreme. Let me say that again. If God's word is not supreme in our lives, then the God of the word is not supreme. And that simply means that if we start moving in our life, there, there is a life that if we're not careful, we can begin to live that becomes the antithesis of what's happening. <coughs> if God's word is not supreme, we will move from certainty to hesitancy, to complacency, and end, the, end up with, with spiritual apathy. And do you know that? You, you can start out excited, but if it simply goes to where it's just getting worse and worse and worse, we simply look at God's word then. It's just being something that we put on the table. And not something that we put in the heart. So what, what, what do we do with, with this incredible word? Well, first of all, let me give you some things that you don't do. First, you don't want to despise the Bible. Now, when I talk about despising the Bible, I mean that, that you, you have people that will come to you and they just hate everything that, that you say about the Bible. They, they, they run against you and they, they really don't have any time for it. But what it does is they just despise the word of God. Those are the ones that are the Bible haters of this world. You, you know those that when you come in contact with them because they just have a them and vigor of taking God's word and carrying it to church. But then you also have not only those that despise the Bible, you have those that deny the Bible. They deny its power to be able to move us in our life, to discount the power of God's word is like rewiring a house without turning off the main breaker of energy. How many of you have ever been shocked as a kid growing up? I remember as a child of about four years old, took a bobby pin, found a plug, and stuck it in it. It didn't take me long 
to realize that that was a bad, bad idea. You see, but that was just a small shock. What happens when you have a world that wants to continuously take the power away from the one who is power in our life? Continues to shock them. Continues to hold them at bay. What about those that distort the Bible? What about the wackos and the lunatics and the fruit loops? The ones that will take you, take just enough to make a theology out of it. But the problem is, is it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into a darkness. We know men like that. That have done it throughout all of generations. Jones and, and, and how those have been brought underneath a, a guy had a tragedy because of who he said there was a point where he was preaching and then finally taking the Bible and dropping it to the ground and saying, I am God. And people fell alongside of that. They were so hungry for something. Here's something which scripture tells us in Proverbs that to the hungry, even the bitter tastes sweet. To those that are hungry for truth in God's word, even the bitter they will begin to accept, even though in their mind they're saying this isn't, this isn't right. But they will continue to go with it because of those who have distorted the truth. In Psalm chapter 14, verse 1, it says, A fool says in his heart, there is no God. Many times when we look at others that are trying to portray God, it leads us to a fourth way is that we learn to dissect God's word. How many of you, when you were in school, had to dissect frogs and things of that nature? That was, that was always the time I loved science. Uh, the rest of it was just boring to me. But when you're dissecting, when you're pulling out, when you're looking at the muscles and the tendons and all of the different things inside of there and the, that incredible aroma of formaldehyde, it's always there. When you're dissecting, you're, you're learning how different things work. My friends, there are people that will look at God's word as being like a math book. And, and like secular theology, they, they try to dissect it in about 16 pieces. The problem is that they're, they're looking at the words of a song, but they don't hear the melody. They, they don't hear the song of grace. It's because they're too busy trying to explain why it's there. Guys, have you ever been in a situation to where you, you just couldn't explain what was happening? Overwhelmed, stuff of that nature. We can spend time trying to explain it, but if we're walking in faith in God, we just <coughs> enjoy the moments to be in it. And that's why when we look at it, but there's, there's another one. They have the greatest, I believe, that begins to threaten the power-filled vault of God's treasure in his word is when we both look at the written word and the living word and we approach it this way. We disregard it. We disregard this incredible book. These are those that read it and do nothing with it, like the coffee table decoration. It is a keeper of records of generations of those who have married and those who have given children. But basically, it is, is now just become an empty repository of information rather than the priceless vault of what God has given us for the treasures in our life. When we disregard God's word, God's word is his love for us. It is his love letter to us. It is a love that is expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it says that if I have not this love in me, it doesn't matter what I do. I can be just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I do not have God's love in the midst of my life, if I do not hold his love letter and allow it to be a part of my life, all I'm doing is simply just Walking a pathway that ends up to be empty and fruitless at the end. See, God's word is the word of truth. Something that the world doesn't like to hear about. But when we look at God's word, listen, we will only learn the authority over the devil of self and sin when we come fully under the authority of God's word. Let me say that again. In our life, there are things that God has given us authority over as a child of God. He's given us authority over the devil, over, Satan, uh, over sin, 
and over self. That's the authority that he's given as a blood-bought child of God. Now, can we mess that up? Well, let me ask you. Have you ever messed that up before? God, God kind of encharges you for something else, and then you come back saying, well, that, that, that didn't go well. That's why we've got to rely upon what God does for us. But in order for us to be over the things that God has us over, we need to be under the things that God has us under. We are under his word so that we can be over his world. And this is not a way by which we simply push and have different responsibilities and relationships that we try to navigate and push around. This is a relationship that we have with God first so that we can love each other best. My friends, I know that in our lives, in order for us to truly walk away that is worthy before God, we have to recognize the truth of who he is and what he does by the word like which he has given us. This is, this is God's instruction for us. And I've learned that if you just follow God's instruction, life becomes a whole lot easier in the end. It allows us to be able to walk in such a way that we can see his will and begin to start looking at it. It is more than just a simple acceptance. There are those that I know that will accept God's word, but here's how they approach it. When they open up their heart to Christ, they will simply allow God's word to be fire insurance. How many of you have fire insurance on your home? Okay, well, it's kind of one thing. We have that just in case something happens. But my friends, God never designed his word, his truth, his salvation to simply be a fire insurance. I mean, there are people that may accept Christ as Savior, but they don't live their life with him being Lord. What does that mean? Savior means I've, I've paid the price. I've, I've saved you from the fire but my friends, God wants us to live on fire. And that's that lordship. That's where we walk. That's where we glean from him. That which God would have us to do and that which he would have us to become. Because with the word of God itself, just simply having fire insurance simply means I'm having Christ as Savior, but not Lord. But as soon as we make him Lord of our life, that is when the fire begins to fall not only in our life, but now through our life, catching everybody else on fire. Have you ever caught somebody on fire because of your testimony before the Lord? To when you walked away, a small spark was starting to grow. My friends, that's what God calls us to be. He wants us to be men and women that catch the world on fire because of the truth of his word. But not only is it the truth of his word, it moves to the worship of that truth. This is what we begin to see in chapter 8, starting in verse number 8. So they read distinctively from the book. And in the law of God, they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. That was Ezra and those that were around the Levites, those that would help them to understand what God's word meant to them at that moment. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and the scribe, the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept. Let me stop there just for a moment. Because when I, when I was reading through this, this, this was the first time that they came together as an assembly like this for hundreds of of years hundreds of years and so they're coming together really for the very first time again to reinstate something that God had already placed in the hearts of those that were to follow Christ all the way back with Moses all the way to this time to remember this particular time in their calendar to honor and glorify God Ezra would begin to read now remember this is from from from, done, I mean, from, uh, from the beginning of dawn for almost six hours, Ezra. And then when Ezra you know, had to stop from reading, others would come in and begin to read. And they would just continue. Six hours they were there in worship. There was a worship, a lot of singing. No, it was just a lot of reading. 
But what that worship was, was cutting to the very quick of the very hearts of the men and women that knew about God's word, but for so many centuries had never had the chance to really dig into it all at one time. My friends, I don't know if you like going to places like buffets, but, but I do. See, you can go to a restaurant, and, and you can look at a menu and get a little of this, get a little of this, get a little of this, and when you see how much you just paid for it, it just makes you sad. So when I go to a buffet, I'm going to get at least three days' worth of food all at one time. I, I just, just kind of build up and go into that. I remember the one time we had gone to Texas Day, Brazil, uh, over in Tampa, and I share that because when, when my wife and my daughters went, we began to go, this is a carnivore's heaven, but when they were just eating more of the more of the grass, you know, that's the salad. salad. Yeah, it's something like that. I won't pay that much. It's not going to ever be a salad. But, you know, if they're eating a salad, I'm like, well, they're going to eat the salad. I'm not going to get my money's worth with them. I need to eat their meat. But I did. You know, I just, it's one of those things that you go into that. When you're eating and feasting upon God's word, you not only end up being stronger because of who you are, God's words begin to convict you of where you are. The people at this moment, they just began to weep at the word of God, the worship that came because of the spirit that was now sending down upon them in an amazing way. And God was moving people to where he wanted them to be. And they wept openly. They wept because of the truth. That comes where does worship come from it comes from the word of God it comes from who God is not just in his written word but in his living word if you look at the rest of the scriptures here Nehemiah you know, it says that the, the people this day is holy Holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people wept. When they heard the words of the law, that's what they wept. And when he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, <laughs> drink the sweet, and send portions to those to whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord. Is your strength. Let me ask you something this morning. Where's your strength coming from? Have you ever felt days where you are so depleted? Energy wise, it seems like everything is left. Emotionally wise, you are tapped out. Mentally, you are stretched thin. Hard to be joyful in those days, isn't it? To in the midst of what it seems like a, a weight that begins to pull you down to where like the quicksand of this life, you're just trying to get the next foot right out in front of the other. And it's, it is hard to be joyful in it. But God says, listen, if you just turn your eyes toward me, if you just worship who I am, I will give you the strength that you need. I will give you the direction that you need to go. I will give you victory in whatever it is that you're fighting against. My friends, we try to do so much on our own. And God says you can't do it that way. The word of truth is fueled by the worship of truth. And that worship is knowing who God is and who I am not. I am not the master creator of this universe. But I'm someone that the Lord Jesus Christ died for in a way that allows me to now be a part of the singing saints of who he is. What happens when we look at the latter part of verse number nine? Again, it's, it's that part about the weeping. My friends, there's going to be moments that God is going to break our hearts, and, and it will. But when those moments come, we then realize that through the worship of who he is, we can still get started with the work of truth. Work of truth is found in verses 13 through 14. Just as a snapshot, 
It says, now on the second day. Now, they had just started the first day of the feast. And now it's continuing more for so It's the second day. And the heads of the father's house of all the people with the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, going all the way back to Exodus, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seven months. My friends, this, this is where you, you see the people get it. See, they're in the midst of just hearing God's word and it's, and it's penetrating deep in their lives and they're weeping before the Lord. They want to make a change in their life. They, they want to do something that is now going to glorify God and who he is because of what he has done. And then the second day they look at it and say, hey, what is this about booths? What, what is this about you know, what they did in Moses? Now, we, we talk about booths today. We, we think about the strawberry festival. But what this was is the make sure they, they had the, the branches, they, they had the stuff that they would put together and they were commanded to make booths during that time, living in a place that was a reminder of God's courage and God's provision in the midst of the wilderness that the children of Israel walked in. Now here's how it, it played, because they, they would have them in different ways. They, they would make a booth outside of their home. When I was in Israel some years back, and it was during this time of the, the festival of the booths, and I began to see homes that had the little makeshifts booths on the outside. And here's what would happen. It's the family would go out. that They would have dinner out in that booth. Sometimes the family would create it in such a way that they would be able to sleep out there at night. It's, it's how they developed it because it was a reminder that when Moses and the children of Israel were in the desert, when they were waiting to go into the promised land, they lived they lived with the coverage of God over them. Even when they were disobedient for the 40 years, that God's coverage was still over them. God's provision was still upon them. God had a purpose for them. My friends, listen to that last part because sometimes in our life we feel as though we can get so far away from God as a child of God that God can no longer use us. My friends, that's a lie and it smells like smoke and it's from hell itself. Hell wants to keep you defeated in your life because hell knows that you are a warrior for God. And all we've got to do is show back up to get our orders and start moving back out. The booths were a reminder of God's coverage in their life of what God would do if they would just simply see the things of God not just in the, the word that he gives not just in the worship of who he is but now in the work of what he needed to do because God calls every single one of us not just to enjoy and become fat on the fat of the land by which God has given us he's called us to be spiritual, spiritual warriors to go out and to begin to minister to those who are around us to lift up those who are now downtrodden to be able to share God's promises with those that are lost as a ball on high grass to go to those who are hurting deeply because of life itself and say I know someone who can heal that pain friends that's what God calls us to do and it's the moment where the children of Israel are living in the booths that they recognize the, the coverage of a creator you see the booths is that which had to be created by things that were natural palm branches and things of that nature not bricks What's the difference between bricks and what they did? Well, bricks, you can take credit for it. I mix this, I mix this, I make this, and I got bricks. My friends, can you take credit for a stone? Can you take credit for a branch of visitation? We can't take credit for it. Why? It's because we needed to get to a place, and they got to the place, to where their coverage was only provided by God. Not by them. My friends, when's the last time you encountered something in your life that only God could intervene? That if God didn't come through, you were a goner for sure. That's your booth. That's your booth. 
It's the place that you go to in the times where you're struggling and you're hurting and you're not sure. And you go to that booth and say, God, I know that you answered me here. God, I know that you protected me here. You are faithful today. You are faithful tomorrow because you have been faithful all of my life. My friends, when's the last time you went to your booth? I said, God, I need you now so that I can understand who you desire for me to be. Sometimes we can be filled with so much stuff of the world that we forget to, to feast on the word of truth. There was a, a farmer that didn't like the high cost of oats. And he needed to take care of his mules, but he didn't like the cost. So here's his idea. I'm just going to sort of separate. I'm going to add in together, not, not just the oats, but I'm going to add in some sawdust. Some filler. Now the mules ate. And they continued to eat, and they continued to eat, and they continued to eat. Until they died. And what did he find out? Because he was substituting more... Not of the grain, but of the sawdust. And though it satisfied, in a sense, their eating, it did not satisfy their hunger. What is this study in Nehemiah chapter 8 going to do for us? It's going to get us back to the grain of God's word. Guys, there's a lot of things out there that we can read. Devotionals and Items that help point us to God's word. But it will never replace God's word. And the question is, is are we taking the time to read it? Every day, is it just a snack on a Proverbs here? And maybe a little bit of Psalms over here. Maybe a, a devotional here. My friends, it, it starts that way, but there's a, there's a hunger that grows. When you begin to read God's word and you begin to see how much it applies in your life and how much others need it as you engage with them in life. Because we have a world that just needs to know, does somebody love me? Is, is there any hope for the situation that I'm in? For many of our officers that go and they encounter the darkness every single day. Is there a light that brings me out of it? My friends, we have the light. We are not the light. We're a lamppost. But my friends, when we walk in the ways that God would have us to go, we burn brightly and we hold the darkness back. And it's time for the church to start holding the darkness back. Because it's time for the church, for the Lord Jesus Christ, to get back to the very word of who he is, the written word, so that we can understand the living word. I'm going to challenge you as we go into this chapter about how much of the word are you partaking. Now, this is not about a dogmatic type of uh, enthusiasm. Say, well, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. No, it's not. It's, it's about you allowing the appetite for God's word to grow in you. I tell you, if you put a child in front of broccoli, chocolate cake, which one are they going to go with? Donnie, which one would you go with? Okay. Something about that chocolate cake, because that's sweet. That's, that's, that's kind of one of those fun meals. Broccoli. That's nasty. You put a lot of stuff on it where you can't touch it and taste it. My friends, God's word is the broccoli, it's the corn, it's the green beans, it's the asparagus, it's the squash. Now, I want you to know, I, I say those and it just kind of hurts a little bit inside because I'm a carnivore. <laughs> but you know what? I, I found out over this last week, I need to get a little healthier in my life. That means I need to eat a little bit more vegetables and not just be a pure guy. I heard someone say amen. Don't do that. <laughs> Because God gave us a balance in life to feed this body. God gave us a balance to feed our souls. And it's time we start living life in balance. Let's pray.
Father, thank you. First and foremost, for who you are. That God, we are simply amazed because of what you do. Father, you're good to us. Better than we ever, ever deserve. And so, Father, with that, we simply don't want to take that for granted. We want to take that to you and say, oh, God, help me to be the one that you have called me to be, to be able to speak and to do and to live a life that reflects the glory that is found in you. Father, it is time for the church of Jesus Christ to get out of the closets, to get out of the dimness of trying to placate and play down and not be a part of. And it is time for us as a church to stand boldly before you and boldly before this world and say, God is our truth. And His Son, Jesus Christ, is the living Word. Father, that's the life we need to live. Because that is the hope that you give. God, I cannot wait to get into chapter 8. Because what a great chapter that is going to be about truth. And when we live truth, the lies have no sway over. Uh, so bless us as we go into the time of invitation. And let us speak boldly with our hearts toward it. This I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, let's all stand together. And as you go into the time of invitation, let God speak to you of where you need to be. Pray that God will move upon you as you go into this world that continues to be dark, but God has called you to be light. Pray for our medical personnel to not just be the representative of health and of healing and of wholeness, but to be the representative of the one who is the great physician that brings it all to us. My friends, we are all first responders because God's word said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added. But what is all these things? Life and life more abundantly. Thank you for coming. Remember, Thursday, 5.30, come join us for some vittles. And then right at 6 o'clock, we're going to jump right back into our study of Revelation. And I cannot wait to get started because it continues to point to not just where we're going, but a God that holds us right where we are. Let's bow and be dismissed in prayer before you. It's you. It's you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, Arianne just reminded me, for those of you that know Miss, Miss Annie and Brother Fitzhugh, I was able to spend some time with them yesterday, but, but Brother Fitzhugh is in what we call the last season, the last steps. I was able to go by and pray with him and his family and Brother Fitzhugh is being taken care of by his kids. I pray for the strength of their kids. And we know that it's not long before God is going to call Brother Fitzhugh home. Tremendous warrior. Love the Lord. And sometimes the hardest part is the family having to watch in the process. And we ask God to be merciful and gracious. Because we love this man. And we love this family. Ah. 
but we know God loves it more. So we ask for God's hand to be upon the family, and when he's ready to take Brother Fitzy home, because he'll leave this world and be in the presence of God, and he will be just as he is, fully redeemed and in a body that no longer aches and has pains. Father, it's sad for us. We know that when people leave in our life, but my friends, that's the joy of the gospel. We will see them again. So be in prayer for Miss Annie and Brother Fitz, you and their family as we get ready to leave out today. Let's pray together. Father, I lift, lift up the entire family. So Nat and Brother Fitz, you and the kids. God, I pray that you will help us to be an extension of your hand in their life. Pray, God, that you will help us to call them, to text them, to write them. But most importantly, every single day to pray for them. To pray for your presence and peace. Father, I pray for all of us right now that as we leave out from this place and we move forward into the next week and all of the different things that are still in preparation, getting school ready and starting back with colleges and all of these things. God, help us to walk worthy of that which you have called us to be. And that is a representation of the living word in our life. To simply carry the light to those that need it. Father, for those that we lifted up earlier, who have physical needs, who have heart needs, who have hurts within their life. God bless them right now. Bless us all that as we leap forward from this place, that we will begin to put a fire in our life that we will set this world back on fire for you. Because it's grown dark. And the enemy loves the darkness. It's time to push it back a whole lot more. So hold us in the grip of your grace until we see you face to face. This I pray in the precious and awesome name of my Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said... Amen. amen and amen. God bless you as you go. Looking forward to seeing you on 39 at 5 o'clock. 530.